Sam, so I'm Mark Weymouth. Uh, some people are kind enough to call me the Sensor Guy. I'm probably better known as the Friday Good News Guy, but really, I'd like people to know me as Sensor Guy because my business is Plus Automation. Our catch line is helping people make sense of sensors. Brilliant. I mean, there's not really much to add in terms of what you do. You help people make sense of sensors, right? Yeah, so we're really in the world of factory automation sensors. So we're the UK importer distributor wholesaler for contronex and then process automation we're again uk importer for a specialist range of optical sensors for the food and beverage industry particularly dairy uh, and we also work with an italian machine safety company ria but you could summarize all three of those as industry leading technology leading sensing companies uh, so we have the luxury of working with three very good manufacturing partners interesting so yeah i guess you work with customers suppliers whatever you call them all across the uk offering various services and levels of support in terms of the the sensor activity and making sense of them i guess yeah indeed we cover the uk and ireland um i'm the first to admit after a decade and a half more than a decade and a half of working with sensors that sensors can be pretty boring they're not the most sexy and exciting thing what is interesting is the challenges our customers set us and the real wide diversity of things they do whether i'm talking about the business they're in or what we do with them so uh i often describe it now in terms of speak to somebody and they've had their breakfast so they've probably boiled their kettle using electricity generated on wind turbines that have got continent sensors on they may uh put some milk in the coffee hopefully from a dairy that's using satellite sensors the packaging of anything they had almost certainly had continent sensors on and we're a lot of steps through the process of manufacturing things that people just don't think are manufactured really yeah a lot of that exactly that might just have been the example that you used but a lot of that's food and drink related is that the general it's really it's there really is. trying to give an example that's slightly out of the norm to be honest uh the business that i got involved in and led to plus automation so the business i came to turn around was continent uk and at that point my predecessors had been very lazy and only really worked with the car industry and in the UK, Continex is certainly very well known in the car industry and not particularly beyond that. Um, so my turnaround and subsequent purchase has been involved in just diversifying them. So one of our biggest customers would be the wind turbine industry. So alternative energy, car industry is big, packaging industry is big, and the packaging industry tends to be food and bev. So uh, I like saying food and bev because a lot of people don't tend to think that they're cornflakes are manufactured or that their vegetables come in a plastic bag that is manufactured but yeah we make yeah. bits that go on widget making machines or we make bits that build cars or we make bits that package your food i think that's a, a general consensus across the whole sector though isn't it when you know the the general population that aren't involved in manufacturing don't quite realize how much of your day-to-day is manufactured is made somewhere in and around in and around the uk or, or beyond um how did you get into this world of sensors and how have you developed things to where they are today the first third 40 percent of my life was tier one automotive supply uh prior to that i was an electronic engineer so most of my automotive time was nothing to do with electronics Later on in life, things change around. Having done a few business transformations, I moved to the sensor world to do business transformations. The last business transformation I did, uh, to paraphrase the Walter Kayam advert, was that I turned the business around to such a point that I liked it so much I bought it. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. So, so you've been running this for how long now? 2019 april 2019 so five years five and a half years interesting time to take on and start a new business i guess 
Yes, yeah, some interesting times. Uh, hey, I mean, statistically, that means the last three years have been absolutely amazing <laughs> with growth. But no, I had the luxury that I redesigned and leaned the organization using somebody else's money. And then I purchased a very lean, very efficient, very slick running business. Uh, and I am old enough to want things to run well, and therefore I only work with companies who I know will uh, manufacture very good, very reliable product. And I tend to pick customers who have the decency to pay well. So uh, I try and have an easy life, and that equates to customer loyalty because they also like product that just works. That's so just uh, yeah. spend a lot of time trying to have a boring life selling things that work to people who want to buy them. <laughs> You're going to change your motto to uh, not making sense answers. I want people to have a boring life. What well, um, what makes class automation different from potential competitors or others that are offering similar services? Would you say it's difficult to say what makes us different? Uh, we. We have the luxury of working with some good partners. So I guess one thing that makes us different is we do have a range of unique solutions. So our manufacturing partners make a uh, product that varies from the me too, me too plus something clever to absolutely unique uh, and get quite a lot of enjoyment working with customers, maybe telling them about something absolutely unique and five years later they come back with the perfect application. So I guess we're a little bit different there, but really we're a consultative self we help people solve problems then later on they come back to us for other things and then it's usually because of service price etc that we get other business uh, so there's nothing intrinsically that makes us different we just tend to operate well smoothly um i guess a couple of years ago when the industry was struggling with supply chain we didn't really ever have any supply chain problems a couple of times the only times I can think of, we sourced parts out of America, we sourced parts all over to keep our customers going. So there was phenomenal loyalty after that. I think, unfortunately, maybe uh, manufacturing tends to have short memories. So all those people who thought we were wonderful a few years ago have probably forgotten about that now. But yeah, I guess ultimately that that alone, going that extra step, that extra mile during difficult times does make you different. And hopefully... Yeah, it does make things memorable that they, they keep coming back. Do you have quite a lot of repeat custom then, or is it lots of new clients every time, or is it you know, a continuous stream of repeat? To some extent, it's hard for us to understand our true customer base or to see it because more than two thirds of our business is through distributors. So right. often we are talking to the end customer, but they're sourcing it through their local distributor who we supply, so there's a little bit of a disconnect. Um, but generally, a lot of our business, I guess, is project related. So you get the order or you might get a queried on, query on something you spoke to somebody three years ago. So yeah, there tends to be uh, a lot of longevity and loyalty. I really, really struggle to think of any customer we've ever lost. Mm. That's, that's a pretty good place to be in terms of uh, having a business with, I guess, what in the in the tens hundreds thousands of customers what what we're talking that kind of direct customers a couple of hundred because as say two-thirds of our turnover actually goes through distribution so they're selling them to many many more people so what i count as one could be another two three hundred yeah yeah quite a, quite a big network when you start to actually look at those sorts of things um i want to talk a bit more about the industry and obviously we can't talk to Mark Weymouth without talking about good news. Um, but before we go on to the good news, what would you say is the biggest challenge from a plus automation point of view that you kind of face and either are overcoming or are concerned about? I guess a challenge of frustration is uh, how under-resourced UK manufacturing often is. Uh, you can statistically see that we have very low adoption of automation, we have very low adoption of uh, robotics. I tend to see that as a lot of people are wearing many, many hats. So we might deal with a maintenance engineer, we might deal with a design engineer, but perhaps one of his three hats is the thing that he's 
trained to do that he knows about but he's also doing other things and that makes people nervous so they're often not keen to step outside of their comfort zone i work with brands that aren't particularly well known in the uk with my manufacturing partners so that's a disadvantage uh we have some amazing product uh with new technology and that's a hard product to sell so we tend to sell very reliable consistent well-established product here in the uk but i have a little bit of a frustration that i know our european competitors are working with different sensors doing different things yeah no that makes sense it's a uh... Going back on that automation problem, I guess it's a why. I mean, that kind of answers the wider uh, industry challenge as a whole. But I think when the makeup of companies, particularly SMEs in the UK, is is very low numbers of employees, it makes it even more difficult because ultimately the the owner in most instances of that business is actually getting involved in the day-to-day -day and they're running the machines and they're you know, doing the sales they're doing the lead generation they're doing absolutely everything as it is so automating and dig digitalization and all of those sorts of things they're on the list but they're not high on the list on day one because ultimately they've got business to keep yeah as human beings we tend to be busy and we tend to dislike what we don't understand so automation tends to be presented as a complicated thing there's a lot of vested interest in making either automation appear complicated because you're going to charge a large amount of money for it as a consultant appear complicated because you're a media journalist uh, presenting something it's far more interesting to watch a program about how they build mini cars or airplanes in very complicated automated systems but sometimes I get really frustrated and do say to people, yeah, my belief is automation, improving OEE, improving your business can come from a 60 pound center sensor that reliably counts your output. Yeah. Automation doesn't have to be difficult, doesn't have to be, you don't have to change 100% of your business next week. Ideally, you might work towards changing 80% of your business, but the most important thing is just improve 1%. Maybe not tomorrow, tomorrow's Saturday as we speak, but improve 1% on Monday. And that can be done really simply. And a personal set side project passion is really working with SMEs and helping them improve a little bit. And we have particular products that are really well suited to get improvement and in technology into the hands of SMEs because it is actually really simple, really affordable to make quite a big change. Mm. Definitely. I mean, yeah, that there's a whole piece there around that incremental change and not necessarily looking at the end goal, but you know, working very much backwards in very small steps to see what you can do to improve by that one percent on the next day. And I think the key difference with an incremental change is even a small organization has resource within it that understands it. If you wanted to make a machine run more reliably, odds on the operator knows a lot about it. The operator doesn't understand how to put a new ERP system in. Not many people do, but there is scalable resource within an organization to make changes to the OAE of a machine, to eliminate a bit of waste, to get rid of some confusion in goods inwards. So address those things that you can resource. Uh, yeah, uh, an ERP system, an MRP system. I'm not saying they're not a solution. They're just outside of my skill set. My frustration is that businesses can help themselves they've got the resource yeah and it's essentially overcoming that hurdle and that fear of there's too much information out there so i'm just going to shut the door and forget it. it's not there and it's just just sitting down and working out what needs to be done not doing it for the sake of it but doing it for the right reasons for the business i guess yeah, and small incremental improvements and lean tend to be a little bit boring. You don't read about them on air, aeroplane magazines. People don't talk about them that often on networking webinars. So people focus on these incredibly complicated solutions that are too big for them. I'd like to talk about the boring stuff of just making it a little bit better and making a little bit more money. Maybe that's a focus for our UK manufacturing marketing campaign is get it on aeroplanes because they're you don't have a choice then to sit there and read it. Yeah. Um, 
So surely that presents a pretty big opportunity, though, if you're saying automation is not very well um, sourced or very well taken up within the industry. Surely that's a massive opportunity for growth. I'm a salesperson or a business person, so uh, unfortunately, a large amount of my character is far too influenced by money. And therefore, my biggest frustration is I think the UK has a phenomenal opportunity. If the UK was a business, it would be bought and turned around by somebody because we have some of the lowest productivity. We have some of the lowest investment. We have some of the brightest brands, some of the brightest people. There's phenomenal opportunity. And, you know, Hey, we joked about it a bit, but on a Friday, I talk about those businesses that are doing incredibly well because they're just doing things a little bit different, but in the same country, selling to the same market, using the same human beings, but yeah. maybe a little bit more technology. So just for people that don't know, there's really not many people that don't know, but where where did that, obviously you're a very big advocate and supporter of UK manufacturing and you post the um, Friday Good News posts over linkedin and where did that start and how have you maintained that how i've maintained it i don't know so i'll skip that question with a lot of patience from my wife um so i've been a passionate supporter of uk manufacturing for a very long time uh from starting out in aerospace and then automotive but more recently in the build-up to brexit i think um i was getting frustrated by all the negativity and so many people were saying to me oh yeah why do you stick with manufacturing everything's just going to die when brexit comes uh, don't get me wrong i think brexit was a terrible mistake but it's not a mistake i can change all i can change is make a business work after it and i thought we need to stop talking down this terrible impending disaster the uk will be full of successful companies post brexit so i tried to think what i could do and i thought well I can't influence anything. I've got no desire to be a local councillor or an MP, but I read interesting things. Surely I can share those. So I came upon the idea of trying to collate good news. And it coincided with a time of I felt there was quite a lot of negativity creeping in, even into professional online networking, things like LinkedIn. So I thought, right, I'm never going to say anything negative going to help it on LinkedIn. I'm only going to share positive thoughts. Nobody needs to be dragged down by my negative thoughts. Uh, I'd start the post and I thought, what else can I do? I'd try and covertly try and squeeze in a bit of coverage for diversity and inclusion by highlighting some of the good things that are going on, attacking those agendas and also apprenticeships. So that was it. Five, pretty much five years ago, I thought, right, I'll try and put something out. And then COVID came along. So Oh, my goodness there's even more need for some positivity absolutely and yeah it's been really good to watch that gain traction um so there's yeah i mean yeah it's nice nice to hear that the that, that i hope you're going to continue doing it because i know a lot of people do follow that and look out for that every week because it 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 does help i think just that little bit of oh yeah that's good there is still endless endless amounts of things that you're posting on there every single week and i'm still amazed that you managed to find all of this stuff that's constantly going on and it's just a good resource for for people when people are thinking oh uk manufacturing is dying well let's have a look at these posts every week and you'll see it's most definitely not to be fair, um, find, finding the stories has never been difficult i have never struggled in whatever five times 52 is 250 editions i have never struggled uh i struggle a little bit to find the time there's many weeks i wished i hadn't started this and then by the end of friday i see so many people who forwarded it on and that motivates me to do it next week so if i was a lone voice shouting i would have given up by now but as so many other people are willing to spread it and echo then i'll keep doing it because i feel i'm part of a, a club of people trying to share some positivity if it was just me i'd have given up by now yeah yeah it's just that there needs to be a bit more traction and a bit just a bit more awareness and uh, yeah, just having little things like this every now and then is definitely a boost um so i mean we all know we've been to these shows before we've been to exhibitions we know how great uk manufacturing is and how good the community around it is and how supportive the sector is and all those sorts of things um so obviously you're exhibiting with us this year for the third year in a row um 
I guess the main question is why? My lazy shorthand of describing advanced engineering is it tends to be full of young engineers. And by that, I mean the people who can be 20, 25 or 55 who walk in the door wanting to learn something, wanting to find something out. We, as I said, we, we're a brand that isn't particularly well known working with brands that isn't that aren't particularly well known in the UK. So we have to talk to people who are interested in something different. So we need inquiring minds. And I like advanced engineering because we seem to get a wide diversity of people with inquiring minds. And I do stress an inquiring mind can be a 75 year old. I'm being slightly contentious, but we need I say that that young mindset of people who get excited by change, get excited by improvement and hopefully we touch a few of those on the show and we build business either later this year, maybe in two years time, but we just spread the brand around a little bit and have the fun of talking about making things move. Yeah, it's that. Yeah, I think it's that initial touch point, isn't it? You, you, I think there was about nine, nine and a half thousand visitors last year, maybe more. That's a lot of people to, to potentially influence and see at least see the brand as they're walking around. Um, which yeah makes a massive difference. Um, as you say, it may not be straight away the week after that you get an order or a conversation about it. It could be two years down the line. But I think it's always important just to have that bit of brand presence and awareness and and growing in in that front. Um, is there anything that you're particularly looking forward to for the show this year? Anything that you're doing slightly differently maybe than last year or? Where are you at in terms of prep and being ready? Because we're a couple of weeks away. I'm still agonising over what we'll show and how we'll present it. Uh, and part of that agony is, unfortunately, advanced engineering is around two or three weeks before the biggest European show for factory automation. So there's no ability to borrow things. So uh, whatever I show will be uh, produced by us. So I don't know. We'll, we'll put a variety of things and we'll see. Um, we were at the Confederation of British Metal Forming exhibition a couple of weeks ago, and most of those conversations were about quite well established solutions. So you always agonize over do you show the new sexy technology or do you show the old conventional products? But as this last show showed, people don't know those products exist or they don't understand why they're better than somebody else's offering. So I don't know. We'll show a variety of things and hope to have some interesting conversations. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, as I say, it's, it's showing as much as you possibly can because if you just go very uh, kind of down one path, it may not appeal to that particular person on that particular day that happens to be walking past the stand. Whereas if you've got a bit more of a open showcase of various different things, something might already spark in someone's mind, which encourages conversation and ultimately that's what the show is about have as many conversations with as many interesting people as possible because you never know where one conversation could ultimately take your business yeah uh, we're a solutions provider so it's almost as if we could do with presenting what industries we're in which would be a lot of photos uh and talking to because we tend to talk to people about what they do and how we can help them rather than what this 18 millimeter diameter cylinder can do yep well, as you know, without saying exactly what it is that I'm talking about, you know there's going to be an opportunity this year to share some of those photos potentially on the stand. Um, I'm trying to leave that a little bit as a bit of a surprise, so we'll, uh, we'll share some of that a little bit closer to the time. Um, so a completely unscripted thing that we've been doing in, in these short little sessions uh, is your opportunity to put me on the spot a little bit. So anything you've got where you want to ask me this was not pre-prepared so i have no idea what mark's going to ask um but yeah it's your opportunity to ask me something and watch me squirm if it's a horrible question a question that sprung to mind and then particularly came to mind when you asked me how long plus automations existed is connex is of a similar sort of age so sam what does sam and what does connex have ahead of it for the next 12 months um so I've said from day one when I started Connex that this was never about building another networking group, another community, another directory, whatever you want to call it. 
that, that, that was not the main aim of setting this up. Um, and I feel like I've been fairly honest and open with everyone from the start. This is not a dark, this is not another networking group. That's not what we're doing. We're not trying to battle for space with all the trade organizations and bodies and all those existing things that are out there. There was always going to be a limit on member numbers because I really want to hone in on what the group does and what we can do together as a bit more of a community and conversations that we're already having within the community. So our focus very much for the next 12 months is you know, we're very close to that target capacity that I had originally laid out in my mind, you know, four years or so ago when I started thinking about setting something up like this. So we're pretty close to that target now. So now it's very much around what can we do specifically for the members, which not only grows their business, but also grows the rest of the sector and just continues that awareness piece around UK manufacturing, especially UK manufacturing SMEs. That I mean, we've said many a time, 99% of UK manufacturing companies are SMEs. Uh, and unfortunately, that 1% of on the other side of things is the one that most people have heard of. Well, most people are hearing of those those companies and not very many here of the SMEs. So anything we can do to support that, connect more companies um, and ultimately grow the sector and build a bit of awareness, which then solve some of the other challenges that we're facing, the skills gap challenge, the automation challenge, anything like that. So I think very much tying up where we're at in terms of member growth and then working out what we do as a as a community, as a group moving forward. Um, we've got a session in November here in Bristol, which is very much around what shall we do next as a group? This was never, you know, I've got an idea, I've got a direction, but I want it to come from the members. Um, I don't just want to go off in a direction if, if no one else thinks it's the right thing to be doing. So it's very much a bit of feedback between everyone, bit of a summary of what we've done so far and, and yeah, looking forward to what we do next. Um, ultimately, collaboration has always been the key word. So think of collaboration, think of promoting SMEs, think of winning business for our members. That is a probably the main thing that we're going to be focusing on for the next 12 months. Okay. And that brings us nicely to the end. So thank you very much, Mark. And uh, we will see you on stand Q170 at Advanced Engineering. Excellent. Looking forward to it.